There's never been a moment in the history of the world where gratitude has been a bad thing. All any of us should really be trying to do with our time and energy and talent is create space for people to be able to take care of themselves. People care for each other and the planet in ways that our current systems cannot and will not. What is the radical potential of care for the future of people, planet, and all living things? As long as we're all exhausted, we're never going to be able to dream how to get there. So the first step is having the time to dream. And that just that feels hard to imagine. Like, how are we going to get to a place where we all really have time to rest and dream? It's not an individual responsibility to make your time to rest, but a collective one that we all have time to rest. everybody and welcome to the Cultures of Care launch. Um, my name is Giovanna Fisher, she, her pronouns, um, and I'm an educator and cultural strategist based in Los Angeles and from Los Angeles, California. I'm the co-founder of Neon Study, a learning studio working at the intersection of creative industry and education. And I serve as the co-director along with Eva Bissell of the Cultures of Care project. I am a black woman with curly hair. I'm sitting in front of my plants and a painting that my grandma drew. Um, thank you all for being here. We're so excited to talk about care and really dive in. Um, and we have a beautiful panel of people to help us explore that. However, there's a few acknowledgements we need to make before we begin our programming for today. Um, I do want to acknowledge that today it is April 4th. On today's date in 1967, Dr. King spoke out against the war in Vietnam. A year later, Dr. King was assassinated. I think in the legacy of care and the work that's required of all of us, it's important to name that. I'll also take a moment to, um, for a land acknowledgement. For me, this work today happens on the unceded land of the Chumash, Tonga, and Kiyos people, both in what is called Inglewood, and Los Angeles, California. If you'd like to name the place you're calling in from, please do. If you are learning the name of the land you're on, we're going to drop a link in the chat to help you locate it. I engage in this land acknowledgement both to acknowledge the land and the people who are its original and current caretakers. The land acknowledgement is a step toward truth 
that the land is unseated, meaning it was taken rather than given, and of the grave harms enacted on Native people by means of taking. This is a single step on the journey of repair, not its end. Repair includes self-educating, learning about how you can support work of local Native people and initiatives in your community and our national campaigns, like Land Back by the NDN Collective, that teach about rematri rematriation of everything that was taken, including the land, language, ceremony, food, education, housing, healthcare, governance, medicine, and kinship. We are dropping the link to the NDN Collective in the chat on YouTube, I didn't say that earlier, pardon, to engage with the repair. I would like to introduce today our ASL interpreter, Toy Bogan. She'll be helping us out through the duration of the program. All right, so let's get into the project and the work itself. Let's talk about cultures of care. Uh, the project was initiated in the fall of 2020 as we faced a deepening pandemic and economic inequality, popular uprisings against state sanctioned violence against black people and an expanding border wall and a deluge of traumatic climate events. The context. Now, personally, I've always sought and found refuge in spaces of possibility. The imagination has been my favorite tool. However, I have confronted my own withering sense of faith in the future that is caring and joyful and healing and just. This project has invited me back to that space. The work of everyone profiled for this project is the present. Their work emerges from and exists amidst these truths. It builds upon the rich legacies of people who have been in the work of care for so long, and it seeks to transform and heal and make space. It honors grieving as part of the process, prioritizes rest. Their works demand that we expand the notion of what care work is and could be, and we'll get into some of it today. Now, it's a beautiful thing that we've gathered here in this space, all by virtual. We've all become familiar with that context of the past two years. Most of us have been navigating ways to feel connected and in touch in spaces like these. Um, but let's shout out the YouTube chat space where we invite conversation, reflection, and thinking through this program. And hopefully the space becomes a space of connection. I trust that it could be. This is a call to lean into it. Lean into the chat, lean into the space right now. We're all here, we came here. Um, and leverage it as a site of possibility. To warm it up, I pose a question to which I invite you to respond in the chat. If we were going to make a collaborative playlist titled Cultivating Cultures of Care, and you are asked to contribute one song that makes you feel cared for, which song are you going to be contributing? Let's drop those answers in the chat now. John Powell contributed Need to Belong by Jerry Butler. Rise Up by Andrew Day. I see Erica Badu on and on. We have a lot. Thank you. All. Great Blacks by George M. Mojo. Yes. All right. We'll be taking notes of all of these songs and these selections. We'll see what happens to them. Thank you all. Now, we're going to be moving into our Let Me In by Sean August Watson. Wonderful. All right, I'm gonna pivot from the playlist and we're gonna move into introducing everybody to the website, which is the hub of all things cultures of care related. It's where the project lives. 
Um, so I'm going to take a brief website guided tour um, before we get into our panel today. I'm going to share my screen with you one moment. All right, welcome to the Cultures of Care website. We're gonna navigate this a little bit together just so we can really unpack all the parts of this project. So this is the homepage. We have the navigation bar at the top, in addition to headshots of all of the practitioners that we've profiled through the project. If you hover over a practitioner's headshot, you see a little clip of the video in addition to the animations that are connected to the video. Here are all of our profiles. And I'm gonna bring our attention back to the top, the green navigation bar. Right here is a drop-down menu of all of our profiles. You can also access their profiles from clicking on their headshot below. I'm gonna bring our attention down to Sonia Posse's profile to reference. All right, here we've arrived at her page. We see another navigation bar at the top, which links to provocations in the learning guide. We'll get there in a moment. If we scroll down, we'll see a full video um, connected on YouTube of the full interview that we did with Sonia Posse. Beneath that are video transcripts for the interview that we did. And in the margins, you'll see timestamp specific locations where that part of the video picks up on the conversation, broken down by themes, in addition to connections to the learning guide, which we'll explore a little more in a second. We can keep scrolling down. All the learning guide connections and videos are there. Some animations. And then we go back to the top, clicking the arrow here. Next, I'm gonna bring us to the provocations. Here you'll find writings connected to the interview that identify key themes, um, connects the work to research and action. These are broken down by key themes and are available for all profiles. I'll bring our attention next to the top and I'll click on the learning guide. Here, the learning guides are resources to facilitate conversations or deeper discussions around the content connected to each profile. You can click here for a PDF version of each learning guide to download. And you'll find the key themes in addition to the discussion questions and additional resources to really bring this interview and the content from each profile to life. In addition to some extended learning activities and projects, um, to deepen your engagement, whether you're a teacher, whether you're in the workspace, whether you're at home. All right. So you can find all that information on the website itself. And now I'll bring our attention back to the top of the page in the home bar for the overview. Here you'll find different elements of the project and an explanation of them here, a little purpose behind the project. And then if I scroll to the right, here are suggestions for how to use cultures of care in your work. Scroll to the right, here are some key takeaways from the project. You'll find 14 practices to create belonging through care that are listed right here. I highly recommend clicking right here to access a poster version of the takeaways, which will be sent to you. And beneath that are provocations from the practitioners that align to the writings that we covered earlier. Bringing our attention back to the top, we have the podcast where you'll find the interviews and you can access them on all streaming platforms. There's one up now, there are more to come soon. And if I click home, it'll bring us back to our home page. Just to frame it up, each of the profiles can see different parts. We have learning guides, provocations, and the interviews themselves. Okay. 
we're going to move on to the next part. Thank you. Now, the website is the portal to the work of so many people expanding on the notion of what care looks like in practice. And our dream is that it amplifies the innovative work that is and has been done. It inspires people to build upon this work and practice care in their lives daily. And that it facilitates a deeper inquiry into what care looks like in practice. We hope it incites new thinking, it creates new channels of connections between people. And today we have a conversation on care that we hope will operate similarly. We encourage you to reflect, respond, and express your curiosity in the chat as you listen in. I'll pass it to the co-director of the project, Evan, now. Greetings, everyone. Thank you, Gio, um, for walking us through that. Uh, we are thrilled to be here and finally be having this work out in the world. Um, I'm going to get us into our panel. My name is Evan Bissell. I'm the Arts and Cultural Strategy Coordinator at the Other Indian Belonging Institute and co-director on this project. Um, I am a white man. I have short cropped brown hair. I'm wearing a white button down shirt with black buttons and I have some uh, wonderful uh, Birds of Paradise uh, behind me with their brilliant colors. Um, welcome, Kent. Thank you for joining us uh, as the second ASL interpreter. Um, so, you know, we're really excited to introduce this panel uh, because in practice and also in its deepest roots and their deepest, the, the deepest roots of their work, um, each one of uh, these individuals uh, reflects a worldview that's centered in care. And one of the questions that we've been asking centrally in this project is how care might guide and shape um, belonging at a societal level? Um, and how does care require the transformation of our political and economic spheres, as well um, as the micro connections that we have between us relationally as, as individuals? Um, you know, we know from our work at the Institute that othering suspends care in pursuit of other priorities like profit, power, speed, um, or resource extraction. Um, so that's some of the context we step into. Um, we also want to just name, you know, and, and also as evidenced by this panel, that um, this work builds on and, and is informed by people who have been thinking about care in this way for a long time. Um, so just wanted to name some of those, those the folks who have influenced this project and that we are um, hopefully building on that legacy of, of work. So disability justice leaders, Leah Lakshmi, Piepsa Samarasina, uh, and Patty Byrne, uh, Black feminist thinker, Audre Lorde. Um, ranging from the Mothers on mothers for Welfare and Wages for Housework campaign to today's work um, on policy with, uh, with the National Domestic Workers Alliance. Um, we we're also thinking a lot about the writing and leadership of Winona LaDuke um, and, uh, and from, from Winona LaDuke's work to the Just Transition Strategy Framework, from the Black Panther Free Breakfast Program to the many mutual aid projects that um, popped up during COVID-19. Um, all of this is to say that we wanted to expand uh, through the nine profiles that we did, we wanted to expand the conversation uh, and to reflect how cultures of care are created uh, and what they can do. Um, culture shapes our political and economic systems and we wanted to celebrate concrete ways of creating belonging in the context of othering. So I'm gonna introduce our panel and then we'll get right into it. Um, so first up, uh, Christina Wong uh, is a performance artist, comedian, um, and elected representative. Thank you, Christina. Christina is the founder of Anti Sewing Squad or Anti Sewing Squad, um, <laughs> and uh, is also has a new book out um, uh, called The Anti Sewing Squad: Guide to Make Mask Making, Radical Care, and Racial Justice. Uh, and Christina's off Broadway show. Christina Wong, Sweatshop Overlord, um, I think is now um, moving out of New York and into various different places around the world. So uh, check that out. Thank you, Christina, for being here. Um, Danny McLean is an award-winning journalist, um, uh, a soccer player, um, who, who, who reports on race, parenting, and reproductive health. Um, her 2019 book, We Live for the We, The Political Power of Black Motherhood, um, is really a phenomenal black feminist text um, and just an amazing example of how this lens of care uh, can help us think about society as a whole and social analysis and historical analysis. Um, and so we didn't get to interview Danny for this project, but um, so I'm so glad that you're here with us, Danny, and you get to, to join in this conversation. Um, Elliot Kukla, um, thank you, Elliot, for being here, is a rabbi, a writer, a painter, a disability activist, um, and transgender activist, activist and a loving parent. 
Um, and for over 15 years, Elliot has offered spiritual care to those who are dying or bereaved. Um, I've been hugely grateful to your writing, Elliot, um, particularly in these last two years since I've come to kind of know your work um, and the way that it helps us think about uh, disabled and queer wisdom um, uh, guiding us and adapting to this moment of planetary transition, um, but also just as a parent. Um, and so I just really appreciate that. Thank you. Um, and then last on our panel um, is uh, John Powell, um, who uh, I am grateful and honored to work with as the director of the, of the Othering and Belonging Institute here at UC Berkeley, which is a research institute that brings together scholars, community advocates, communicators, artists, policymakers to create belonging without othering. Um, and John is constantly expanding how we think about care and how we can grow this circle of human concern. So thank you, John, um, for creating this space for us to do this work. Um, so the question I want to start with is that, um, is really just, uh, the, the revisibilizing of care. And so we want to start with just a little bit of a personal question. And this is one of the things that Elliot, I think you shared in your interview, but builds on the work of Patty Byrne, which is that we all need care at some point, right? It's just a really a matter of timing. Um, and so just to say who has cared for you these past two years, um, who do you want to express gratitude for? to for that care and what does that care maybe allowed you to do? Um, and so Christine, I'll pass to you to get us started. Thank you. Hi, oh, I thought we're, <laughs> sorry, I thought we're starting with Elliot, but I'll, I'll go. Um, I've, uh, I'm Christina Wong. I'm uh, at the, I'm on Tongva land right now, specifically the boardroom at South Coast Rep where I'm working on a project. So behind me are, photos of past productions. And I would like to say that the I have so much gratitude for uh, the aunties of the Auntie Sewing Squad. Uh, the aunties are cisgender, trans, non-binary. Uh, we use auntie as a, just as a, a term of endearment. And it was actually kind of a very lucky thing. Um, I started uh, Auntie Sewing Squad in March 2020 to sew masks. Um, for vulnerable communities, thinking that it was going to be just a two or three week stopgap until the government did their job and distribute masks to everybody. And we know that's not what happened. So we went on for 17 months, uh, grew to about 800 aunties across the country, across 33 states, distributed 350,000 masks for vulnerable communities, First Nations, for, for migrants at the border, farm workers, incarcerated communities, sex workers. And um, the work didn't happen just by me commanding that everybody sew masks. It was a lot because we had to build a culture of care. Uh, it, it became very clear that it wasn't sustainable to just demand that everybody sew and sew and sew and, <laughs> and give and give and give, but that we had to find ways to take care of each other. And so... Uh, we had everything from Zoom yoga classes that other care aunties offered up. Uh, we had a whole system of care aunties. Um, and me as sort of a comedian, never done this kind of mutual aid work before, uh, sort of running joke was I was the sweatshop overlord. And I think leaning into the humor of how unreasonable it was, I, the whole joke was I'd be like, if you don't sew, I'm going to cut your fingers off. And that was clearly, at least to most of the aunties, such a joke <laughs> that it, it sort of pointed to how necessary it was for us to take care of ourselves and each other. So, um, which I think is from oh, Jerry Springer, but it does have real, it, it's real that we do need to take care of ourselves. Maybe we don't have to listen to Jerry Springer do this, but uh, tell us to do this. But anyhow, um, that's who, who cared for me. And, and it was in, um, it was all sorts of displays of care from just like messages, just reaching out to people dropping off home cooked meals to me also relishing in moments to, to, to shower aunties and, and care and let them know they were worthy of care. Thank you. Um, so Elliot, yeah, we'll go to you next. Uh, hi, I am Elliot. I am a white um, non-binary person and I am in my green office with lots of green plants. And I love this question. The first th that thing that comes to mind really is my um, immediate family, which is my partner. And I also live with queer chosen family and my kid. And really pandemic has made it very 
uh, the enormous amount of care that has gone into like maintaining my family unit and home during pandemic that's made it possible for me to do the work that I do in terms of um, supporting people around grieving illness and dying and writing and teaching about that as well as being with people directly. There, it's made it, pandemics made what has always been clear to me, but so much more clear in terms of how much care goes into home itself and how we care for each other in the most immediate relationships and how much care our individual family members have gone. We're a high risk family to sort of maintain and are still maintaining a pretty shut down and, you know, closed physically, although we're on the internet all the time, um, family unit to make it possible for all of us, my partner's a therapist, to be doing all of this care work for others, but to be caring for each other and with each other, you know, 24 seven in this different way. This, um, conversation also brings up for me the question also brought up for me the fact that we had um have had a paid care worker who was part of our um part of our pod um doing both disability access support for our family and child care that made it possible to for everything that we have done during pandemic and really how um how vital paid care work is and how often it is not paid properly or recognized and how vital domestic work is to this whole um, care work conversation. Um, so I just feel a lot of gratitude for having had that support in my life and wanting to visualize that as well and really having seen through the work that I do in institutions how much the um, devaluing of that work is really a part of the devaluing of care um, in society as a whole. So thank you. Thank you, Elliot. Um, yeah, we'll get deeper into that too. Um, Danny, what about you? Well, hi, everyone. I'm so um, glad to be part of this conversation. My name is Danny McLean. I'm a black woman um, in a red turtleneck sitting in front of a white and wooden screen that's hiding the mess behind. Um, and let's see. I mean, I so appreciate this question because what an opportunity to thank and acknowledge all the care that I've received in the past two years. I think, you know, what's important is that um, there, you know, there was a period March to December uh, 2020, when I would say the primary people who I was receiving care from and, and in community with um, were my friends with whom I was on group chats frantically trying to figure out um, COVID safety guidelines because we felt like we weren't adequately, you know, getting any information from institute gov government institutions about how to socially distance. I think especially as a single parent um, living alone in a home with my child, I was really confused about what social distancing would mean for our family. And so I, I really think about my friends and just my network of people who helped me um, think about how to make life work. Um, you kind of at the height of those stay at home orders. Um, I think about the preschool teachers who created and maintained a safe environment for my child to be able to go to school. My mom, who was, um, you know, part of our bubble and really helped care for my, my daughter. Um, and then things really shifted in January of 2021 when my mom had a massive stroke. Um, and my role shifted from thinking about care primarily in the context of caring for my daughter to thinking about how to be, um, you know, a caregiver for my mother. I'm an only child. My mom is, um, you know, unmarried and lived by herself. And so my, um, my life as a working um, unpartnered single parent really shifted so that I could provide care um, in the midst of a crisis, um, a health crisis that my mom was going through. And so I would say in, in this past maybe year and a few months that I've been in this situation, the people who have provided care for me have been a community of family and friends who have done everything from fundraising, um, doing research to help me better understand Medicare and a whole range of medical and legal complexities that we were suddenly faced with, 
um, people who showed up at my house and built a ramp and made other accessibility changes to really my mother's home so that she could come here after um, her hospitalization and, and um, stay at uh, inpatient rehab. Um, the people who helped me go through a frantic move to merge two households into one so that I could live with my mom and take care of her, my daughter and I. Um, friends from all over the country who flew into town at the height of a pandemic, many of whom were very, had very strict um, you know, um, social distancing practices, got on a plane in um, 2021 to come here and help me. Um, people who stayed with us overnight as I learned how to do things like wheelchair transfers and help um, someone, you know, my mom who now had uh, limited mobility shower. And there were just a whole bunch of skills um, that I didn't have that I needed help with. People who um, cooked and brought food, people who offered childcare, people who sent gifts, people who helped me remember who I am as a writer, as a um, person with an intellectual life uh, during this past year and some months when all of that has really had to go on the back burner. Um, I also, as Elliot did, paid caregivers. I mean, the two in particular, I just want to call them by their first names, Daniqua and Candice, who um, have, care, have helped me and helped us care for our home and care for my mom. The, another one of the gifts that they've offered me is really the opportunity to learn about their work to learn about the intermediary role that um, agencies can play and how their ability to make money, um, just that that the role that agencies play. I still have a lot to learn about that. But I also learned a lot about what it means to be a paired, paid, and continuing to learn about what it means to be a paid caregiver during a pandemic, both in terms of um, their health and safety, but also I've watched them parent their own children through school shutdowns and remote learning. And I've watched them be on the phone while they're here at our home, helping their kids with homework and doing all the things that they need to do in their own homes. Um, but their their care has allowed me to at least turn some of my attention back to paid intellectual work, while I also know that my mom is getting kind, compassionate, uh, professional care. I'm so happy to be a part of this conversation and um, I so look forward to, to hearing from everybody on these um, on this important topic. Thank you, Danny, for sharing that. It's the, I love just the reflection of how uh, many or it's how many places care touches, right? And how complex the system is that you're that you're speaking to. Um, and for folks who are just kind of starting to think about this concept, right? That it touches all of these different parts of our lives and society. Um, John, um, uh, what about you? Uh, who has cared for you or who would you like to express gratitude to? Uh, well, thank you um, um, for and, and, and all this for hosting this. Um, my name is John Powell, I'm director of the Institute, uh, African-American man. I use he, he him. Um, I have a gray shirt on. And I sit I'm sitting in front of a, a painting of a quilt uh, in my house. Um, so I was thinking about the question, uh, and I think a great question and like a lot of, uh, good questions, it could take all day and we still wouldn't be done with it. Um, first of all, I think here is a very complicated concept and, and, and to the extent it's been professionalized in the United States, it's also been feminized. We thought of, th think about who's in the role of care and oftentimes they are underpaid and underappreciated. Um, and so all of us need care, uh, but some of us are more on the giving and receiving end. Um, and I think um, that needs to be acknowledged. Uh, on a personal level, you know, I, when I was thinking about the question, there's so many people that have participated in caring for me. And, and I start really with the Institute and we have a thing at the Institute where we talk about a circle of human concern uh, where no one's outside the circle. And even though we say human concern that concern extends beyond humans, it extends to different expressions of life in the earth itself. And that's aspirational, but that's what we try to move toward, a uh, circle of human concern when no one is outside the circle. Um, and, uh, you know, there's care from strangers, but there's also care in my context from families. Um, people who know me know that I have this pretty amazing family uh, and we care for each other in uh, hundreds and thousands of ways. Um, uh, you know, I'm busy, I'm too busy. I don't give enough time to rest, uh, but I have uh, an assistant. Uh, and I don't know, as you may know, or if you tried to reach me, her name is Maura, 
but she's more than a sister. She's a friend. Uh, you know, I, I care about her. She cares about me. Um, it's, it's more like a family. Um, there's a saying, which is everybody needs a body. Uh, and so we really need each other. And in the midst of the pandemic, two things. I actually contacted WHO and suggested that they had made a mistake by asking for social distance. They should ask for physical distance and social solidarity. Um, and they actually changed that on their website, partially, I think, in response to my provocation. Um, but also in the pandemic, I had an operation. Um, and um, a number of people, uh, I can name them, I hesitate to name them because there's so many and I don't want to leave people out, uh, but I will name a couple of people, uh, Gerald and Wa and, and Karen, his uh, wonderful wife, brought food over on a daily basis. Um, two friends moved in with me uh, because I was not mobile. Um, uh, Paul uh, from LA and Alana. Um, and again, uh, it was in the midst of the pandemic. Um, my neighborhood just um, really rallied around me. Um, and so it was really a sense of, while well, it was actually a beautiful thing. I mean, I was recovering, but I was also in the midst of all these caring and loving people. Um, and so uh, I appreciate that. And I, I'm, I, the work at the Institute is really try to make caring uh, mutual and, and regular. Uh, and part of our culture and society, and not something that we expect for uh, from women or from people who are, quote unquote, not having the high paying jobs or high paying position. Um, and I'll just end by just saying, I think it's really, uh, while we talk about self-care, self-care is limited. We need each other. Uh, and, um, you know, nobody gets through life alone. No one comes into life alone. We're literally born into the world connected to another person. We don't survive without care and from others. Um, so uh, sometimes we forget this in our individual, individualistic society. Um, so I'm glad you're doing this and that we're having this conversation. Thank you, John. Um, and that teases up really well for the, the next thing I'd like to ask you all, because all of you work in a way that um, really prioritizes kind of collective care um, in the ways that these uh, kind of almost the the micro analysis, the micro ways that you work, the the, the deep um, focus on relationship and connection actually becomes a lens or a portal into thinking about broader change. Um, and so I'm curious about how, uh, you know, care guides the work that you do at another level for shifting kind of a broader social change. Um, and how does, how does care specifically help inform that work that you're doing? Um, and I'm going to, at this time, I am going to start with Elliot. Um, uh, Elliot will leave us a little bit early today, but I just want to start there, Elliot, just so you can um, get, get some time in there. Yeah, go ahead. You know, I was thinking about this question, and in many ways, care is the broader social change for the work that I do. It's both the micro and the macro. So the work that I do is all concerned with um, being with people around illness, grieving and dying and becoming more disabled or living a disabled life. And that individual care is also about thinking about how, um, also how do we create a more caring world? And I think that the two are very connected. One of the things that I've really um, come to feel from um, my disabled life and being with other people in their disabled lives as we're in this moment of transition and world change in a very profound way is that so many of the things that I've learned from being with people at the end of life as they die and also through navigating my own disabled life is that the same things that we need for our disabled individual lives are also really needed in this moment of uh, when the planet is disabled. And also some of the things that I've really learned from dying people really apply to this moment when many of the ways that we are used to living and being are dying. And that's hard to name. 
but it really does feel very applicable. So to, to just kind of name a, a few of those that I think all really revolve around care, you know, one of them is, is interdependence, that um, being chronically ill has really made it impossible for me to maintain an illusion of, interdependent, of independence, um, slowing down, needing to have more rest, um, prioritizing um, loving relationships over a, a sense of achievement or moving or um, a kind of linear sense of my life, um, needing to draw on a relationship with my ancestors on a regular basis and really prioritizing the time that I spend sleeping, I'm someone who has uh, chronic fatigue and have really struggled with thinking of that as wasted time and struggling to find that as time that's extremely meaningful in terms of what can I dream in that time in terms of a new way of, of being and living. All of the, those things that's really helped me survive in my chronically ill life and have helped me to be cared for and offer care for others also really feels like what we need for the future right now and what this planet needs. So really the work that I do as a, in terms of bringing more care to my own life and to other people's lives is really exactly the same thing as my sense of social change care. So care is, is the goal as well as the process for me. So thank you for asking that question. Beautiful. Um, Danny, I want to pass it to you to build off of that, just because I think the your work, um, particular around Black mothering and thinking about the the legacy of that care and the way it's built in and kind of curious to hear you answer this question with, with Elliot's uh, provocations in mind also. Hmm, mm -hmm. Well, I mean, I so appreciate Elliot really pointing out that care, you know, is at the center of what he does. I, as I explained, honestly, care is my work right now. Um, so there's that, but there's also, um, yeah, the fact that my, my beat, you know, professionally, my beat has been parenting and reproductive justice. Um, and so that's, you know, I've been writing about, um, I've been covering reproductive justice organizing since 2012, past decade. And it's all about care, right? It's all about care for and sovereignty over our bodies. Um, the book that I wrote is called We Live for the We, The Political uh, Power of Black Motherhood. And I'll just share a little bit about where that title came from. And it's funny because We Live for the We has almost become like a different way of saying you're welcome in my circles. Like someone will do really something really kind, you know, for, for me and uh, for, my, for my family. And I'll, I'll thank them and they'll say, well, hey, you know, we live for the we. Like that's just what we do. That's how we roll. Um, and I want to share a story um, actually relevant to you know where um at least our our hosts are based there in the bay area um i was interviewing kat brooks who um many of you know um i don't know if kat's still hosting the kpfa morning show but um at the time that i interviewed kat in the summer of 2018 she was running for mayor of oakland and um i and you know, I got to know of Kat's work because she, her, her work with police accountability, supporting the families of um, people who had been killed um, by police or died while in police custody. Um, and I think you know, she supported Oscar Grant's family. Oscar Grant was killed in 2009 by Bay Area Rapid Transit um, officer Johannes Meserly. Anyway, I'm interviewing Kat. It's the summer of 2018, and for this book is about motherhood. You know, for this project on motherhood. She's telling me about her relationship with her daughter, who at that time was 12. And she was saying that um, sometimes her daughter would, you know, Kat is an organizer, she's an activist. So she would have her daughter at, at rallies, at meetings. They had a life that was very much um, connected to community work. And she said, you know, my daughter will sometimes say, um, why can't we, you know, like spend more time just the two of us? Or can we go on this hike? Can we go to Disneyland? Can we do these things? And I mean, I, of course, Kat and her daughter did these things, but she told me, you know, um, I tell my daughter all the time and it's harsh, but we don't live for the I, we live for the we. And as soon as she said that, I was deep in my interviewing process at that, uh, at that time. But as soon as she said that, I knew that that was going to be the title of the book. 
because everyone who I had talked to, um, black mothers, grandmothers, um, people who had raised kids that weren't necessarily, you know, their own biological children, all expressed that they saw their role as being bigger than just caring for some small family unit from the people in their homes or, you know, their nuclear families. They saw their role as a parent as um, having a much broader focus and that just as much as they were responsible for their own child or children, they were responsible for um, their children's peers and for transforming the conditions um, that their that their families lived in and that would, you know, so that they could thrive, not just as individuals, not just as, you know, a nuclear family, but as a community. Um, and so I think that that's, that has really set kind of the goal for my reporting, um, both with the book and then in the, the articles that I've reported ever since, is just really this desire to better understand um, how, how we take care of each other. And I know that there's a question later, and I'm, I'm really interested to talk about this, like, how do we how do we take it to scale, right? Like what are there policy solutions? Are there a series of policy, policy solutions? What are the cultural shifts that need to happen so that this isn't just the work of kind of, you know, people who have awakened to this as an approach, but that we can start to take this to scale and more of us take on this, um, this work. Thank you, Danny. Um, yeah, and Christina, I want to turn to you just because I think uh, Auntie Sewing Squad, uh, in some ways, you you actually created um, something at scale. Well, yeah. I mean, not, you know, at, at a degree of scale, right? <laughs> so, how did care, how did care guide the creation of those systems, and then you know that as a model for broader change? Sure, it it became really clear at the top of the pandemic that capitalism wasn't going to get us, wasn't going to save us, and I, 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 it became clear to me how used to. to Cap transactional relationships everyone was so uh people knew i was sewing masks so they were like can i can i buy some masks and i'm like i'm actually not selling i'm doing this because your health is my health right like and trying to reteach people that just because you sent me a thousand dollars it's appreciated it'll eventually be capital will be used to you know maybe pay for shipping or materials but really what is the most important thing is people we need someone to, i need you to, I don't care if you make six figures in your other life. I don't care if you're like an award-winning filmmaker right now, you're a cutter. You're going to cut this fabric. You're going to cut this bed sheet up for me. Right. Um, and so it was like this moment where I realized uh, we have to reteach people how to understand how to, how to transact with care labor, that this is not something you don't get in front of the line because you have more money to offer. Um, in fact, the most valuable thing you have to offer is what you have to give up yourself, whether it's sewing labor or care labor. And very much, um, it it wasn't a matter of like, oh, we need to figure out how to pay everybody so that they stay. It was like, we need to, we need to create a community in this very scary time in which people feel invested in the work they're doing. And because we're caring for all these communities that are in need of masks, but we also need to ask the, those if we're going to be accountable to the health of others, you have to be accountable to our health. And so this is not as black and white as write us a check so we can pay ourselves. It's 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 express care in other ways. And it was really incredible. We had kids write us thank you letters. Like we encouraged if you if you, if I couldn't put your kids to work, <laughs> we we had kids who would bake brownies and we distributed those to aunties. We'd um, we had one, uh, Mrs. Wan, she's like 90 years old, or she's like in her eight, late 80s, and she used to be a customer for Disney, and she sewed a lot of masks, and she was really missing her sister because her, uh, she couldn't travel to Michigan. And so her daughter, Sunny, asked us all to write postcards from wherever we were in the country to her mother, and her mother collected those. So it's it, it was these very different ways uh, to express care. There was a uh, we had a care coordinator, uh, Auntie Gail, who um, some of the requests that she got from aunties who needed support were just things like, I just need some words of encouragement written out to me. <laughs> and uh, and it was really incredible to sort of understand this moment that was sort of suspended from capitalism fixing a situation and really understanding how our relationships to each other and the care and support we gave each other was actually more valuable than a check. And so uh, 
I, I've been thinking about so much of that time. I was like, wow, I've never had relationships like this where I don't even know what these people do for a living, like outside of this. Like, I just know they were willing, they're willing to do this work too, and that we are connected in our generosity. And wow, I wish I could have more relationships like this, just minus a pandemic where we're all scared about dying and our relatives dying and our friends dying. So, um, so I think about a lot of that moving forward and how to just create more meaning in relationships and and can i approach new friendships or relationships or situations not for what i'm going to get out of the situation but is this something really meaningful where we could just both take care of each other in this moment so it's very abstract but this is what i'd gotten out of um yeah this experience of auntie sewing squad i mean it's abstract but you also you know auntie sewing squad i think one of the things that's you know really significant and unique is that you created a whole set of systems and roles around it right mm -hmm. um in order to care for each other in a reciprocal way and i think that's one of the words that we haven't necessarily brought up but i think reciprocity in care is something that uh is lives in so many of the profiles that we did um in the way that how do we create systems and structures that have a, an element of reciprocity in them right um, and so, John, thinking about that and the ways that belonging creates a space and the way that Circle of Human Concern creates a space for us to think about broader social change, um, where does care fit within that uh, for you and how does it guide um, how, you, how you lead and do your work? Well, you know, a number of things that people have already spoken to. So, uh, Donnie's thing of, we live for we. I mean, I love, I, I love that title. Uh, and, and um, um, and it's right, you know. It's, it's, it's the way the right to world. Um, the the idea that um, this is not just transactional. Um, so uh, the work you're doing with aunties, I mean, to me, even, even hearing that, it's like it's really powerful. Not just for the number of people involved and the number of people served, but also for showing a different way. Uh, but I do think we have to then get it to scale. And when you think about healthcare and you know the idea of putting care back in healthcare and you know when I, I i work at uc berkeley so i have one of blue you know um gold standard health insurance but it's such an inhumane system you know you, you something happened and it's like before they ask you what happened before they ask you if you're okay before they ask you if you're gonna live or die it's like do you have insurance you know and it's like this whole first do you have money you know, I mean, it's like, you know, uh, and these are not quote unquote people on the front line, they're not bad people. It's a system is so hum inhumane. Um, and so we've worked a lot, uh, with trying to help put care back in the healthcare system. Uh, what does that really mean? Um, and you know, you think of I, years ago, I was asked to write uh, a policy paper for a foundation. Uh, on how to reduce uh, black poverty, and I said, I didn't, and I said no, no, thank you. I said, um, I said you know, we, we're offering to pay you. And I said, no, thank you. We'll pay you more. I said, look, it's a waste of time. Uh, and and this is before Black Lives Matter had become a part of our culture, right? As as a saying, but I was saying, black lives don't matter in this country. The problem is not policy. The problem is a lack of caring. The problem is black people don't belong. So the problem is not a problem of poverty. Poverty is an indication in this country of not belonging. And if you think about someone like Reagan, who talked about the undeserving and deserving poor. So who's the undeserving poor? When he's saying you're undeserving, it's like we don't, you don't deserve uh, what Judith Butler calls grievability. Your life doesn't count. Um, and we have a system that reflects that in thousands of ways. It's not per people personally, but it is. It's not just people personally mistreating people. It's people systematically being mistreated, being invisibilized, being dehumanized, being othered. Uh, and so that, that to me is the heart of the work, is to make everyone visible, to say that everyone counts. And it's tricky, it's, and, and you know, we can think about it in terms of top down, but it's also horizontal. Um, sometimes, you know, I, I, I wrote a small piece when at some of the height of the Asian attacks uh, in, the, in the country, and people were like, Why are you writing about Asians? It's, you know, it's like this is another marginalized group, but it's, you get into, well, they're not the real group. You know, we got to focus. Can, and, and we don't have a deficit 
a limited amount of care. We can care for everybody. Uh, and when we care for everybody, there's more care. It's not like, well, I have five widgets of care and I'm gonna use them on my family. Um, and so part of it is to try to change the discourse, to try to understand, change the, uh, our relationship, but also try to understand, change systems and structures that reflect care. Um, and this is huge tension in this country and in this world as to who really counts. Uh, I mean, it's amazing. We think the whole meme, Black Lives Matter, and then you get a pushback saying, no, they don't. Not really. Uh, and so, um, and you know, this thing, I wrote something for a teen magazine, uh, and they were saying, and people asked me to write something about this young white readers, millions of them, it was a large magazine. And I said, they're still, st still struggling with the concept of Black Lives Matter. My first reaction was to say, really? <laughs> you know, I'm, I'm not even going to do that. But I did it. And one of the things I said is, in, in response, you get off the top, all lives matter. All lives can only matter if Black lives matter. Uh, I mean, the fact that we, I mean, having that discussion out front, and what we see, not just in the United States, what we see in Ukraine, what we see all over the world, uh, of ways in which we say certain people's lives don't matter, the earth doesn't matter, except if it can be extracted to give us stuff. Um, this is not sustainable. This is not human, not humane. Uh, so I think this is the heart of the work of belonging to say that, again, all lives matter, that the circle of human concern, but all lives matter only has meaning if all lives matter. If you don't have police shooting people and then hiding behind uh, you know, qualified immunity, so that's not the police that created qualified immunity. It's the lawmakers. It's the whole system of saying some lives don't matter. It's okay to kill these people to keep these other people safe. Um, so uh, I think it's a huge job, but I also think it's the right job. Um, and I'm hardened by the fact that I get to work on this, but also that all the people on this panel are doing this work in various ways as well. Thank you. Um, yeah, and I think it's, you know, we mentioned it earlier, but just this shift in worldview or cosmology around care, right, as a, as a kind of uh, guidance for the ways that those that shows up in our policing systems, our economic systems, our political systems, um, right, that, I think there's been some really great uh, quotes pulled out in the, in the, in the chat, um, if folks want to pull those, but there's some really wonderful things about how, the ways that care shapes those broader systems. And so we want to offer just a, a video and, and kind of hear your response. Um, this is uh, coming from a place that has uh, a longstanding um, uh, worldview rooted in reciprocal care with land and ecosystem. Um, so this is an interview we did with the Karuk uh, Department of Natural Resources uh, with Annalisa Tripp and Vicki Preston. We'll just play it. It's a short uh, one minute uh, video, and then we'll uh, talk a little bit about, about this. So Mark, if you could play that, that'd be great. If there's only like one, you won't want to take it. But if there's more than one, then it's like you can gather there. And then if it's like a whole bunch, then you and your family or whoever else could possibly gather there. And so that's, what you look for and that's how you know that it's not somewhere that you could just go even it's someplace that your family could go or you know your whole community could go and i think that that's important to recognize the impacts that you have on what is able to be shared amongst other folks and so that kind of spreads it out to like you know how is it not just like one plant able to care for you but maybe multiple plants being able to care for a whole community of people Great, thank you. So um, yeah, part of what we love about this little, this clip is it, it's a reflection of uh, the acknowledgement of how we are in relationship to each other um, and how we treat those relationships, right? Is it one of kind of extraction? I'm gonna get everything I can for myself and then give that to other people or do we cultivate things in a way that creates space and opportunity and abundance for others? Um, and so I wanted to ask about how this has made, how, how care has helped you think about who you, who and what you're in relationship with, ecosystems, humans, animals, um, and how has care made you think about this larger we as we do this work? And John, you're really speaking to this. Um, so maybe we'll come back to you and kind of see if that inspires more of this conversation and then move move in. Um, and I'll also prompt uh, folks who are listening in, if you'd like to drop uh, questions in the chat, um, uh, please do for now. And then we'll take a couple of those, hopefully. So 
So I don't know if you asked me to respond or something happened. Yes, sorry. Yes, I was asking you to, to kind of, uh, you know, continue on with that, but this is as a, as a, as a provocation for that. So, you know, it's, it's actually interesting because I think, um, you know, we talk about interconnected. So I would push us even further. Uh, and that is uh, the, the idea of I am because you are. I, I only exist because you are. Uh, so it's, it's, it's in a sense, caring for you is caring for me. Um, and, and so I think, unfortunately, what we've done is commodify relationships. Uh, and so it's what can I get from you? Uh, and it's really about a, a deeper sense of being and how do we organize a society, a world, a culture that reflects that. And so part of the thing that that video suggests to me is that we start off with a scarcity model. There's only one. I'm, I'm going to take it. I'm sorry, you know, for the rest of y'all, but I'm taking this and going home, right? And then I have to build a fence or build a wall because you might come try to get my stuff, you know. This, and this is, you know, this is classical uh, um, Thomas Hobbes. You know, it's like we need a state to have, so we can protect ourselves from other people taking our stuff. You know, uh, it's, what, it's not our stuff, and and what we have of value is each other. Uh, and so I think the, the, the reciprocal nature, uh, and even reciprocal might point us in the wrong direction. It might, again, point us to a transactional. Uh, but it's, it's more like we are deeply, profoundly interconnected. And so it leads into what we oftentimes don't talk about, a spiritual dimension. We certainly don't talk about that in the context of the, of the economy or in terms of capitalism. Uh, it's like, how much money am I going to save? How much money am I going to make? Um, I listened to a podcast. Uh, there's a professor at Yale who's one of the most popular courses, a course on happiness. And she talks about the students have shifted. So the major reason they, they want to think about what they should study, not to learn, but to enhance their um, uh, market, marketability when they get out of Yale. It's all about, I need to make more money. That's why I'm here. Um, so that's not a reciprocal relationship. That's that's not a relationship at all. It's a, a predatory relationship. Um, and so I think, and, and if the, the good news is, and I think it is good news, what she says to them is that will not enhance your well-being and happiness, right? So, and that's good. I mean, it's like uh, which you're heading down a very dark road. Um, and um, so I think the more places we could say that, the more places where people can belong. Uh, and belonging means that everybody is participating, that we care about everybody. Uh, I'll just end by, I was in Toronto a number of years ago. No no city, no country is perfect, but there was um, a shooting and a young black teenage girl had been killed. And there was this police officer who was, I think the chief of police for Toronto at the time. And visually he seemed like a large white guy you know, you almost think of a, and he was on television talking about the killing of this young black girl. And he was visibly crying. And I was thinking, you would never see that in the United States. Uh, a white police chief crying over the killing of a young black girl. Uh, yes, it's wrong. Yes, it's, we have to do all the law enforcement stuff. But what he's doing is saying, this affects me. I care. This hurts. Um, um, I'm vulnerable, we're connected. And I think more expressions of that, more acknowledgement of that is part of what we need. Christina, well, yeah, if I'm curious about reflections. Sure, everything John said, <laughs> everything John said. One thing I wanna say is uh, I didn't realize what I was doing was mutual aid until people kept saying that. And I had actually go, I didn't go to that conference. What's mutual aid? And I looked up on YouTube and it was, I was like, oh, it's like, it it's, it's like an anarchist version of charity in that like, there's no, we don't have a nonprofit number and we don't, you know, um, have a, a board of directors. And, um, but the, the goal of our group is to actually become obsolete because we want to meet the need we've done it and then close. And there was a lot of talk in the group of like, we could totally become a nonprofit. Christina, you could pay yourself a salary. And I was like, no, I don't want to do that. Everything will shift if this becomes about me 
making this my job and getting paid? And then how do we justify all these aunties sewing for no money if suddenly we have this structure in place? And it's okay for things to not be big and big and big and big. And I think when I think about nonprofits and charities, traditional kind of charities, there's so much inequity built into this and and this thinking this thinking around scarcity okay we have resources and we give it to those who don't have it rather than respecting that everyone has something to give even those who don't necessarily have the material so so what am i saying here um for example the anti sewing squad we sent eight vans over the course of the pandemic uh, towards the Navajo Nation, initially filled with sewing supplies because there was a sewing group there that was sewing masks for tribal citizens. And, and I think it's so important, like this structure of thinking of the groups that you're supporting as also having their own agency. I got to meet so many organizers um, who, who were tribal citizens, who were farm workers themselves, right? Um, they just, because of st structural inequities, they don't have the same amount of access to resources as other people do, but they were organizing before the pandemic, during the pandemic, and they will continue to organize after. And I think, uh, that, that sort of understanding that everyone has something to, to bring to it, even if it's not the actual stuff which we don't own in the first place, right? As John said, <laughs> is important. And, um, and to kind of think about how to have more reciprocal relationships, even in the process of giving from one to another, that it's not that someone is needy or poor or helpless. It's just a matter of that the, 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 these equities are in place that they don't give them the access. And so, I don't know. I feel like I'm so much more sold on what mutual aid is and this idea that things don't have to become these, I'm going to become the biggest nonprofit in America. Like that's not actually, maybe it's a good goal for some groups, but I don't, I think that just follows the thinking around capitalism and, and it takes the meaning away and the, and the, and sort of the, uh, the, um, the mutual like love and consideration of each other away when you get into that kind of big thinking. Danny, thoughts or yeah, go ahead. I have so many thoughts on this. I mean, um, you know, I talked earlier about just my my personal situation that that I'm going through with my family now and. Um, all the people who showed up for me, I didn't, I didn't put, it wasn't like we did a GoFundMe. We didn't do it in public. So, um, but I mean, there was a lot of fundraising. There was a lot of support. And I've been thinking about how I was supported by a network that I have because of all the places I've lived all over the country, all the institutions that I've been connected to, the type of professional and political work that I've done over the past 20, 25 years. Um, and how can, and I'm, I just keep coming back to this question of scale, which is really what Christina was getting at in this last, and what she was saying is how, my question is how can this kind of incredible support be available to all of us, no matter how well connected we are or how good we are at making and sustaining friendships or, you know, how many of our friends are organizers and know how to kind of step in, in the middle of a crisis and help you like, you know, mobilize resources. Um, I think this issue of like, and I, and I also appreciate that Christina said, oh, you know, mutual aid, what's that? I didn't go to that conference. Mutual, mutual aid has become this kind of buzz phrase in the past few years. Right. But for a lot of us, it's just like, that's how we do life, especially in particularly com particular communities. You depend on your neighbors, you depend on your extended family. It's just, that's what it is. Um, but I'm, I've just been. I mean, I'm, again, I'm a journalist, I'm not an organizer, I'm not an activist. So for me, where I go with these things is like, what are the stories that I wanna tell? What are the, the stories that I wanna report? And I am very interested in this question of, um, how, how do people who aren't so well networked get in, like benefit from and contribute to these very important, in, in mutual aid? Um, I'm not being very articulate about this, but I feel like it's really important. And it kind of also connects to what, what Christina was saying about C3. Like you start something and then is it gonna be a 501 C3? Is it gonna be a nonprofit? 
There are so many of us who need to benefit from others' aid um, and who have so much to offer as well, but we're maybe not connected to a 501c3. We're not connected to an organization. We're not as well networked. And so I'm really curious about um, how we start to just think a little bit more creatively about mutual aid and how we connect people who are on the margins um, and people, you know, how can we all start to benefit from um, what is available and what is available and being offered? And how can we more of us offer what we have to those who we don't personally know but want to support? Just the one, the last thing I'll say is, um, you know, I this this phrase came up earlier. Um, so I think it was something Elliot said about, you know, needing care is just a matter of time. Right. We're all going to need it at some point. Um, I think of the phrase ability is fleeting. And that's something that Leah Lakshmi Piepshna Samarasingha, who's the author of Care Work, her name was called earlier. Um, it's just so important. And it's something that I think about so much. Um, you know, you might not think that you're in need of care right now, um, but you will need care at some point. Um, and what I've learned through my own personal experiences and John talked about this earlier, you know, a lot of the systems that we have set up are not going to be there to meet our needs. Um, and I just welcome all the conversations that are blossoming about how we can begin to better meet each other's needs. Thank you, Danny. Um, yeah, and I think one of the things that's clear from from our work and our research on this project is that it's, it's uh, you know, it is this both and, right? How do we, uh, Sonia Passi says in one of the interviews, how do we create the conditions for people to collect, you know, to take care of themselves collectively, right? So how does our healthcare system allow us to take care of each other? How does our uh, wage structure allow us to take care of each other? How do these systems from, from multiple places create this, right? Because what we focused on in this project is the spaces that are not considered spaces of care that are creating this care, right? So the dance floor, uh, the drag show, mm -hmm. the auntie sewing squad, um, the Department of Natural Resources, uh, the Karuk Nation, um, these different places, right? And so there is this, you know, kind of multiple scales that we're talking on simultaneously. Um, you know, we're we're just about um, almost out of town, so uh, uh, not out of town, out of time, um, which in which case we will be out of town. Um, uh, and so this question, there's a number of questions coming up about nonprofits and working within nonprofits. And just to, um, you know, and, and this is to what you're saying, Danny, if there's one of you who'd like to respond just very briefly um, uh, about thoughts on that. So how do you how do you create those systems or cultures of care within a organizational structure? Um, particularly if you're not somebody in a leadership position. Um, do you have any thoughts briefly on that? Um. I will say that we, uh, as a mutual aid group, worked faster than nonprofits in that we were, we didn't have the red tape of, <laughs> of like, uh, I've got to check in with the board, we have to approve the budget. Like we just went and, and delivered care. That said, we were able to sort of, we, we, we're able to use a nonprofit named Art to Action, which was actually a performance company, right, uh, to be our fiscal sponsor. So we were able to receive the donations um, that needed from donors who wanted a tax write-off without the structure of doing that. So I don't that, I don't know if that answers the question, but I feel like, you know, it's going to be a long time since we can rework the whole nonprofit system, but nonprofits can support mutual aid groups by signing on as a fiscal sponsor. Other than that, I don't know what to do. <laughs> no, thank you. And unfortunately, we are out of time. And like John said, we could have this conversation for uh, the rest of today and tomorrow and the next day and on. Um, and this is the work that we do, um, right, uh, at the other Belonging Institute and that Christina, you do, and that Danny, you do, and that Elliot does as well, um, and John, that you that you do um, in creating this space for, for many of us. Um, just to close I, out. Oh, go ahead. Yeah, yeah. I, yeah, yeah, I wanted to lift up one thing Christina said about what we're giving to people, they're giving to us. So it's re it is reciprocal. There's some too often we don't appreciate that it, not as everyone count, but everyone has something to give. And so it's not just one directional. I think it's really important to sort of acknowledge the what people who are in need are also continuing to give to us and society at large. Beautiful. Thank you, John. Um, so as a thank you gift for everyone who has stuck with us this hour and, and 15, um, we want to offer a physical print poster of the, the 14 practices of care that we kind of um, reflected on through this project. So 
We're going to drop a link in the chat. Um, and if you'd like to receive a, a free poster, um, please put your address in that in that link, in that registration form. Um, so Joe will drop uh, drop that in. So look out for Joelle Williams um, in the in the link will be there. Please sign up for that. And just huge thank you um, to to all of you. Um, I thank you many times, but thank you again, um, uh, Danny, Christina, and John, and Elliot, and Toy, and Kent as well. Um, and also just really wanted to thank uh, the folks who made this project possible. So Yuri Sakakibara, Alex Lemire, Pasternak. Uh, Maho Calderon, Joe Williams, Erfan Maradi, Christian Ivey, Mark Ebezeb, and C uh, Cecily Saraski. Um, please uh, engage the project, share it, um, uh, use the resources, reach out to Giovanna or myself, um, and we would love to hear from you. Uh, so thank you so much for being with us. Gio, any last word? Nope. All right, cool. Well, have a wonderful day. Have a wonderful evening, everyone. Um, and uh, you know, hopefully you get some juice to take some space for care for the rest of today. Thank you, Evan. Thanks everyone.